I have some positivity with Miles Sanders because he seems to recognize that he's got things to work on. And I think that's very positive uh, because, you know, I, I've gotten killed online and, and Twitter. And, you know, part of this is is personal in the fact that, you know, people attack me for saying, well, he's really not close to people like Galvin Kamara and Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey. That's not an insult. It's just no. reality. And and people are he's better than that. I'm, I'm like what were you got you guys are way overrating this player, so that would be one. But I think he's got a chance to have a nice bounce back season. I don't think he's ever going to be like those guys, but I think he's a good player. He's just overrated. Hey, Mac, Joe and Jan, Birds 365 with my partner, appropriately enough, J-Mac. Uh, we're a couple of J-Macs hanging with you. I'm Birds 365, McDonald and McMullen. Uh, we've got uh, Jeff Kerr from CBSSports.com going to join us in less than 20 minutes from now. All right, John, before we took a break, I asked you, in your eyes, who are the most two overrated Philadelphia Eagles, and you can define overrated for yourself. And no, your definition might not match my definition. There are different ways to get to your definition of overrated. So your answer, I can tell ahead of time, although partially misguided, uh, will not be wrong. No, because I, I, I'm not going Craig Ward. I'm not oh, going Craig Ward. I, that's I, where I, I thought I, you were going, by the no, way you teased it. Because I don't think he's over, uh, overrated. A little bit with uh, certain segments of the fan base. Certainly, if I were saying who does Jody Mack overrate the most, I might say Greg Ward. Okay, fair but enough. overall, look, one guy, and I've I've said this pretty consistently. It's not necessarily nationally because you're seeing where national people place him now is Miles Sanders, and but I have some positivity with Miles Sanders because he seems to recognize that he's got things to work on, and I think that's very positive. Uh, because, you know, I, I've gotten killed online and, and Twitter. And, you know, part of this is is personal in the fact that, you know, people attack me for saying, well, he's really not close to people like Galvin Kamara and Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey. That's not an insult. It's just no. reality. And and people are, he's better than that. I'm, I'm like, what? Were, you, got, you guys are way overrating this player. So that would be one. But I think he's got a chance to have a nice bounce back season. I don't think he's ever going to be like those guys, but I think he's a good player. He's just overrated. And then the second one, and again, I frame this more as the fan base overrates him is Jordan Mylotta, who I love personally, and I root for, and he's the greatest guy in the world. And I think it comes from, and Jordan's a little bit weird too, because he's got his He's got his real big fans in in sort of the punditry world as well. The Brian Baldingers, the Ross Tuckers, uh, who who Ross has been on the show, uh, and those guys played offensive line. The thing about Jordan, his spectacular plays are spectacular. He's so strong and he's so athletic, and his highlight real plays. If you can have highlight real plays for offensive linemen, like we always see Quentin Nelson. People say he's porn for offensive linemen. Jordan Mylotta, when he has those big plays, is sort of like that, but the consistency isn't there. The, the, the wild gesticulations, his, his good plays are great, and his bad plays are really, really bad. And that's why I think Andre Dillard's ultimately going to win the job if he's healthy. See, I base my uh, overrated, underrated more so on – the likes of the national pundits who are putting forth opinions and giving lists as to where guys rank in the lock. Like no, no knock on Eagles fans. We, we love the Eagles fans. That's why we do the show is because we know how massive the fan base is in this town for this football team. But I think they're biased. I think they come in. Oh yeah. With a, no question. Yeah. With an understandable. Yeah. Right. They're not starting from ground zero. They're starting from way to a side with eagle colored glasses on. So if a guy is overrated in the minds of eagle fans, I, I kind of roll my eyes and go, yeah, that's pretty much a given. If he's wearing green, he's going to be overrated. 
yeah, there are the naysayers and then those who look for negative. That's a percentage, small percentage of every single fan base. But the majority of the Eagle fan base is rah, rah, go birds. Uh, so I don't use them as the same barometer as a national guy. I think we got great local media guys, you being one of them here in town, which try and keep it unbiased yet can give you a uh, realis realistic evaluation of what kind of a player a player with uh, an Eagle uniform on is. But I also like the national perspective because, yes, they're not as effective. They're not reading Eagle Twitter on a day-in, day-out basis. So you're going to be able to get their opinion. Sometimes I think they can just be flat-out wrong, but I'll, I'll give them their credit because it's an unbiased opinion. Here's my... And I'm trying to stay unbiased, dear Eagle fans, and you'll probably believe that because you're probably not going to want to hear what I want to say. When you ask a question about overrated, you know you're going negative anyway, so sorry about it. Deal with it. The two guys who I think are the most overrated coming into this season are the two guys that are probably on top of the list of players that the Eagles are considering to sign extensions with. Ooh. And a lot of times this comes down to where are they in their contract? How much time is left in their contract, where the Eagles drafted them, whether they want to take that next step forward and extend them and make a commitment to them and the like. Yeah, I'm not sure the Eagles are well placed in doing a contract extension with either one of these guys. Now, of course, if it's a team friendly contract, then you do it with anybody. But assuming this is going to be a fair comparison to other players who have achieved what they've achieved in the league type contract, I don't know if I would do it with either one of them. And I'm referring to, if you haven't been able to figure it out, Dallas Goddard and Derek Barnett. Both of them high draft picks for the Eagles. Both of them at times have made plays for Philadelphia. But if you ask me, with where they were taken in the draft, and the numbers that are being thrown out, I don't know that I would look to extend either of these two players. Dallas Goddard the last year, and I know that he missed some time, and I know that Zach Ertz was still here, although we were seeing a decrease in the amount of what Zach was capable of doing and uh, the amount of plays that he had last year because he had injuries too. Um, he was 16th in the league in tight ends, receptions, and 16th in tight end yards. That's just barely in the top half of tight ends. If you got a guy who's barely in the top half of his position in the league, are you running out to extend him and lock him up and make sure that he's part of your team going forward if you've got to pay him? Because we're at that point where the guys really need to get paid. You sign your rookie contract, you've got cost control if you're the organization, you get to the point where they have the ability to get free and you have to make a decision. How high are we willing to go? I don't know well, how high I'm willing to go with Dallas Goddard. And even more so, I'm probably more okay with extending Goddard than Derek Barnett. I've seen enough of Derek Barnett. I, I, I know what my opinion of Derek Barnett is. He's an okay defensive lineman in the National Football League. That's all he is. I, I can't even bring myself to get to good. For me, there's great, there's very good, there's good, there's average, there's slightly below average, and there's what the hell is he doing on the team? Well, for me, I'm not even to good for Derek Barnett. He's a slightly above average defensive lineman, and depending on how much they have to pay him, I'd pass on extending Derek Barnett. What are your thoughts on those two guys? I'd love when I get the chance to be the positive guy. So I, I, I don't agree at all with Dallas Goddard. Uh, I mean, he is just a really, really good player. Now, part of this is evaluation. And the second thing is, but Dallas knows he has a big opportunity this year. And he's gotten in the best shape of his life as well. I think he's maturing. So part of it is evaluation. But well, you bring up the numbers. I think he missed five games last year, maybe somewhere in that range. And also, uh, again, Zach Ertz was here when he was healthy. Uh, now, a lot of it, and that's a fair criticism, the best ability is availability. you got to be on the field. If you're not on the field, you're not on the field. You can't help. But it's also you have to be realistic and say, well, if he was on the field, those numbers probably increase. But also, 
he's such a great blocker, and there's so few guys who can do both. You know, there's George Kittle, a couple other guys. And, and Dallas is in that conversation where you, you can move him in line. He's not a glorified flex receiver. So many of the modern tight ends are really just king-size receivers. He can do both things, and I think that helps your offense a lot to be able to do a lot of different things. And that's why the Eagles, and I think rightfully so, are very high on him as a player. Uh, but no question, it's it's partially evaluation-based. And then Derek Barnett, I, I, I hear your argument on Derek Barnett. I think it's a more valid one. A lot of the same criticisms. you got to be on the field, number one. I, I'm a little bit – I think he's performed a little bit better when he is healthy and on the field than you do. Um, I'm not as big as a sack guy as other people uh, because I think, you know, it's sort of like wins for a baseball pitcher. I think what, that's one of the most overrated stats. I I always go back to the, the NFC Championship game and Chris Long's play that resulted in the Patrick Robinson's pick six. If he actually gets home and sacks Case Keenum, well – the Vikings punt the football. Who knows what happens from there? But the fact that he got there and he affected the throw resulted in an inter- interception. Uh, Patrick Robinson takes it to the end zone. The noise in that building, Jody, that you could hear across the river in the South Jersey, it literally, that's the first time I could literally point to a, an exact moment of an NFL game and say they just ripped the heart out of the opposition all because Chris Long didn't sack the guy. He just affected the throw. So, and Jim Swartz would talk to me about that all the time. A lot of good things can happen with a good pass rush. Getting sacks is great. It's never a bad thing, but it's not the be-all, end-all. I think Derek Barnett is a good player when he's healthy. The problem is he's never healthy. So you do have to make that conversation. And with him, it all comes down to money. I'm not going to overpay him. But if I can get... Uh, uh, an extension that lowers him from his current 10 million because he's on the final year of his rookie contract. You could do a lot worse than Derek Barnett, but I'm not comfortable saying he's going to be on the field all the time because he's not proven he can stay on the field. So I hear your argument there. I right, quickie question on the, the, the branching out that you did about the Chris Long play in the uh, uh, NFC championship game. Who decides during game day, statistically, what's a hurry? Because there are sacks, there are quarterback hits, and there are hurries that are registered in the National Football League. Who decides what's a hurry? Well, the NFL has a stat crew at every game, and that's when you see the the, the play-by-play, and they have something called uh, NFL Jesus, which is game stats in stadium for media. Um, and, you know, they have a whole crew doing that kind of stuff. Now, hurries is – it's not an official stat. You know, Pro Football Focus does it as well. Some of these other advanced stats – it's basically like anything else. You have official scores and they decide. Now, there's a time. Wait, whoa, 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 hold on. So it, you're telling me it's an NFL employee, but it's not an official stat? That no, doesn't seem to add up to me. Stat. It's not an official stat. Uh, teams do it. Sometimes coaches do it. Coaches film. They'll go over their own film and have their own stats. A lot of times when you see press releases in the NFL, tackles, for years, you will see the NFLcomp.com number, which is technically the official number, um, and you will see teams who who accumulate stats during the coaches' film, and they will be different because they do it differently. So, you know, sacks, for instance, if, if you bring up this at a good point, this week Pro Football Reference just unveiled their research for years ago where Deacon Jones was the greatest sack master in the NFL and arguably the greatest sack master of all time. It wasn't an official stat back then. So nobody knew how many sacks Deacon Jones had. Right. Uh, they went back and did the homework and watched the film and figured it out. Um, I think 82 maybe is when it became, I, I don't even know uh, when it became an official stat. Uh, so, I mean, football, and I, I've been saying this for years because of analytics and 
baseball. I mean, baseball is a stat-driven game. You know, it's pitcher versus batter. You can do so many different things. Football is not a stat-driven game. It really isn't because you're affected by so many other things. Uh, your teammates, your they call it the ultimate team game for a reason. And then people say, well, he had these stats and this stats. And they look at Lynn Swan and John Stallworth and Joe Namath and Ken Stabler. He doesn't have stats as good as Sam Bradford. Well, you don't understand the game if you're saying stuff like that. Uh, it's not a stat-driven game. You are right on a couple of different <clears throat> levels, the biggest one being baseball. It's mano a mano. It's the pitcher yeah. against the, the batter. Uh, football, it is. It's 11 guys against 11 guys, and sometimes stats don't actually fit and paint a proper picture of any uh, given play. All right, we're going to paint a picture with our next guest. Jeff Kerr from CBSSports.com, scheduled to join us. Had a great article on CBSSports.com yesterday. The coaching quarterback duos in the National Football League. And don't worry, Eagle fans, the Eagles aren't involved in this because they got a new coach <laughs> and a new quarterback. It's guys who have been in place and were in place last year that Jeff Franks will have some fun with Jeff Carr. CBSSports.com next here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.